Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to the webinar. First, I'd like to apologize that I can't be there to give this live and in person at the Smithson Annual General Meeting. But as I'm sure you understand, this simply became impossible with the current government requirements for us not to travel because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, I intend to go through the original presentation that we had planned for the AGM, but will of course provide an update on what's happened to the portfolio during the recent period of market volatility before going through any questions that have been submitted. So, on to the presentation. And first, to the legal disclaimer. We have to show you this, and you should read it, but of course, as Terry Smith always points out, this is simply the long form for, if you like what you hear and decide to buy the trust, then it's your problem and not ours. But I'll leave that rest of that for you to read at your leisure. So we'll start the presentation with performance. Now, this is for the period as stated in the annual report and accounts from inception, which was the 18th of October 2018, to the end of 2019. And of course, the uh, recent trading period um, I will go on to later. So first of all, let's look at what the portfolio has done, and that's the Smithson net asset value, the top line. In 2019 itself, it was up 33.2%. The Smithson share price was up 29.8%, while our reference index, the MCI World Small and Mid-Cap Index, was up 21.9%. We've also, for your reference, put UK bonds and cash in case that's an interesting comparison for you. Now, for the inception period, that's from the October 18 to the end of 2019, the portfolio was actually up 25.5%, the share price up a similar amount as 2019, that being nearly 30%, and the index up 11.8%. Now, we are obviously delighted with these results, but we continue to caution you that this is still a very short period of time, not even being 18 months. And so while we think this is a very strong start, we are still careful to highlight that it is only a start and it is the long-term results that will matter. Now, just to go through a few of the events that happened in the period we are discussing, we have put up the contributors and detractors since inception. Now, I won't go through every stock in detail, um, but I do think it would be illustrative to go through a few of them and just let you know a few things that have been happening in the portfolio. So first, our top contributor to performance during the whole period was ANSYS. This is a U.S software company that provides design software so that designers can create their products digitally instead of having to make physical copies. And so obviously saves a lot of time and cost in the design process. Now ANSYS performed very well as they announced several business wins through the period and continue to demonstrate the increasing integrated use of their software within the design process. Next is Halma. You may have heard of this as it's a UK conglomerate which sells mostly safety equipment and environmental sensors. Now, we like Halma very much because of its excellent ability to reinvest its cash and capital into other smaller businesses which it acquires at very good returns on investor capital. Now, this, of course, makes it a very rare beast in uh, the corporate world, and that is a good acquirer. Many companies tend to destroy value when they do mergers and acquisitions, but we've discovered that Halma, over many decades of track record, have proven that they can do this very successfully. They too had excellent results over the last 12 months and were therefore the second highest contributor to performance. Now, right move I'll go through in a little more detail. I'm sure many of you will be surprised to see it up here as a top contributor, and even more surprised to learn that it was the largest position in the fund for uh, some time last year. Now, the reason for this confusion, I think, is that there is a lot of misunderstanding about the business model of Rightmove. Now, Rightmove actually charges estate agents subscription fees, which the agents pay per office every month, and that is irrespective of how many houses they sell, how much the price of those houses fluctuates, 
and how much the transactions in the broader country fluctuate. Therefore, the revenue for Rightmove is actually quite stable over time and actually growing because what Rightmove is able to do is increase those fees to estate agents every year by selling them more digital products. Um, examples of these are lead generation software or buyer mapping. Um, and so ultimately, it's not exposed to the vagaries of the housing market in the short term. Now, it might be worth noting that during the recent period of COVID-19 pandemic, the UK government has decided to shut down the housing market in the UK so that no transactions can take place during the period of the lockdown, as well as no properties being actively marketed, which of course would have meant people visiting other people's houses. Now, this may prove a little bit more of a problem to right move if it means that estate agents go broke in the meantime. And that is a real possibility because without being able to complete any transactions, estate agents, of course, will suffer a lack of cash flow in the interim. Now, the immediate impact on Rightmove is limited. The reason for this is Rightmove has already offered estate agents a 75% discount to their fees for the next four months. So this is already a 25% revenue hit that Rightmove is taking irrespective of what the government has recommended. Beyond that, though, if estate agents do go bust because they are unable to complete transactions during the lockdown period, then, of course, they won't return to pay full fees once the lockdown is over and Rightmove's revenue will suffer. However, we're still confident that Rightmove will perform relatively well, not necessarily in this year, but in the years to come, and that is because it is extremely profitable. Rightmove has a 75% operating margin, and it has a lot of cash on its balance sheet. So that means that pretty much, however severe the reduction in revenue in the near term is, we are pretty certain that Rightmove will still be able to generate cash and will certainly survive this downturn. Of course, once everything starts to turn back to normal, which may not be for many months and maybe well into next year, then new estate agents will form. And we are reliably told that most estate agents that leave the market, either employees or uh, agents themselves, what tends to happen is as soon as the market turns up, those agents return to the market, either with a new company or by joining others. So we are fairly certain that the estate agency business and therefore right move will rebound quite quickly once this is over. Moving on to Paycom, this is a US human resources software company where employees are able to interact with the software rather than uh, a human resources employee. This obviously saves a lot of cost for any company that takes on the Paycom software. And for that reason, Paycom has seen exceptional growth rates over the past 18 months uh, and continues to grow strongly. Now, one admission by us is that actually Paycom has had the sh highest share price increase during this period, where the shares have almost tripled in price. But because we initiated the Paycom position initially as a small position, <clears throat> and that's primarily because we felt the valuation was towards the higher end of what we were willing to pay, it means that Paycom wasn't the largest contributor to the portfolio performance overall. Now, obviously, that was a mistake. We wish we'd made it our biggest position. But again, it just goes to show that our tenants, which we'll get onto in a minute, of buy good companies, don't overpay and do nothing, are in that order for a reason. We focus on the good company first and think about valuation second. Finally, on these contributors is Massimo. Now, Massimo is a US medical device company, and they were publishing very positive results during the period, um, as well as the fact that they produce a lot of their products in Mexico. So the improving relations between the US and Mexico governments during the course of the year did actually benefit them in terms of share price increase. Now, moving on to detractors, CDK Global is a US producer of management software for car dealers. CDK Global is actually a company that we sold during the year, and I'll explain why. 
Initially, when we bought it, we liked CDK Global very much for its stable and growing core business, which generated a lot of cash flow, but also its faster growing digital web design business. Now, in November of 2018, they had a new CEO who decided quite shortly afterwards to sell that growth business of internet and web design and marketing, and therefore left the company only with the core and slowly growing software business. The company also had a lot of cash on the balance sheet, and the CEO that had come into the company had a track record of making quite expensive technology acquisitions. We therefore grew increasingly concerned that without the growth coming from the business anymore, this new CEO would set out to buy expensive technology acquisitions to try and boost the growth. And we felt that that wasn't a useful way to spend the capital that was available to them. Whilst previously, the old management had set aside a lot of that capital for share buybacks, which we felt was much more appropriate given the current valuation of the company. So given our concerns over the future capital allocation, we decided to sell that business. CHR Hansen is a Danish company that sells bacterial strains for dairy and cheese production. In fact, one of every two cheeses in the world has a CHR Hansen strain. Unfortunately, during 2019, they had quite disappointing results with low growth rates as the consumption of dairy in the emerging markets especially slowed down. They then guided for an even worse 2020, although funnily enough, this has since picked up with the hoarding of dairy products and baby food during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, going forward, they do have potential growth opportunities in new product areas which they're exploring, and we continue to watch those carefully. Now, Sabre is an interesting one. This is a US provider of booking software to the travel industry, so it connects travel suppliers, being airlines and hotels, with travel buyers, like travel agencies and online uh, travel websites, which consumers use, like Expedia. First, I'll go through what has been happening in the last couple of years, and then I'll talk about the most recent events. So they didn't have a great 2019, because Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines, the two airlines which suffered devastating crashes from the 737 MAX aircraft, were both customers of Sabre. And after they grounded their fleets, that obviously affected Sabre's revenue. Sabre was also affected by the bankruptcy of Jet Airways, which is an Indian airline, which also caused them a loss of revenue. These events unfortunately meant that the Sabre share price was um, quite poor during 2019. However, coming into 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, things have got a lot worse. <clears throat> so obviously, with airlines cutting their capacity by 90% and hotels shutting, this means that the revenue for Sabre during this same period will likely be down a similar amount in the region of 90%. Now, the company does have debt on its balance sheet, but it's now had all of its debt covenants waived by its lenders and it's drawn down further loans so that it has over $800 million of cash on its balance sheet. That is an amount that is enough to pay all of its costs and all of its interest payments for at least the next 12 months, even if it were to receive zero revenue over that period. So at this point, despite its heavy exposure to the travel industry, we think the company looks okay. Obviously, we will continue monitoring this closely, and if the pandemic lasts, for a lot longer than 12 months, then we'll have to reassess that situation. Moving on to Fever Tree Drinks, a company I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is a UK producer of premium tonic and ginger and other mixers. And it's actually a company that we bought into the portfolio in July of last year. Now I'll go through the reasons why we bought that in a moment, but I think it's interesting that this is already a detractor to the portfolio. This is, of course, because we started buying the shares 
while the share price is falling. And unfortunately, the share price continues to fall after we'd finished. And I think this just goes to show how impossible it is to actually time the market. Finally, Checkpoint is a security software company. They suffered disappointing growth in 2019, and they claim it was down to issues with their sales force rather than the product itself, which they claim is still world leading. For that reason, then, we continue to monitor them as they address that sales force issue, which we believe will take at least another 12 months to resolve. And after that, we will again be able to reassess how they're getting on. Moving on to the next slide, we can see the Smithson exposure breakdown. So this is how the portfolio looks at the end of 2019. On the left-hand side, we have the sector exposure. In the middle, we have country weightings, and this is as the country of listing, i.e. where the company is listed. And on the far right, we have the sales exposure for each of the companies in terms of the portfolio as a whole. So starting on the left, because of the fact that we exclude many sectors from our investment process, such as airlines or commodities or financials, essentially any sector that we feel does not add shareholder value over time, we are therefore left with a concentration in other sectors, including information technology, industrials, healthcare, and consumer. Now here it looks like there is a very high allocation to information technology. I would say this is actually misleading. This is MSCI's categorization of information technology and not our own. So within that very broad bucket, we would say is included many diverse industries and companies. In fact, several companies are included in that category in our portfolio, which actually we believe would be more suited to industrials. But that's how MSCI measure it. And as we go down, you can see the next largest category is industrials. And I would say this is one small difference to the Fundsmith Equity Fund, because we hold a little more industrials, and Fundsmith Equity Fund would hold a little more consumer companies. Now, the reason for that is consumer companies have tended to grow very large over time. So in our smaller mid-cap portfolio, it has been very difficult to find consumer companies of the size that we can buy because simply they are either very old branded companies which have grown large or they have been consolidated by other consumer companies. In fact, the only couple that we found are Fever Tree and Domino's, both of which we own. The reason we own a few more industrials is because we find smaller industrials a lot more attractive than large industrials, which would have been included in the Fundsmith Equity Fund. This is because small industrials can still continue to grow quickly in their market niche, even in a period of slower economic growth. However, large industrial companies of the type that would fit into the Fundsmith Equity Fund portfolio are more susceptible to the vagaries of the economic cycle because they are now so large and they're in every part of the economy that when the economy turns down, it is very hard for them to keep growing. And that is why they would not be included in the Fundsmith Equity Fund. Going to the country weightings, you can see that the US is the largest country we are exposed to with 46%. Now, <clears throat> the reason that that is the case is because simply we have found the most interesting companies as a balance of quality growth and valuation in the US. And because we build this portfolio piece by piece with each individual company that we discover, and we don't in any way think top down in terms of we would like 46% in the US and 24% in the UK, we come to the balance that you see before you in a very piecemeal, organic way. So therefore, because we found many companies we like in the US, the US has come out to be 46%. Now, the next line down, the UK at 24%, I would indicate is a little higher than you should expect for the long term. Now, the reason for that is because over the last 12 to 24 months, 
when the UK has been very concerned with Brexit, what we've discovered is that many excellent companies that we feel will be very little affected by Brexit itself have seen their valuations decrease from the general market concerns in the UK. And so during that period of general valuation declines, we have been able to increase our position sizes in many UK companies at what we feel is very attractive valuations. Now, the final point I just want to make on the far right-hand side is that actually when you look at our regional exposure in terms of where the revenues of the companies is actually coming from, the order is slightly different. In fact, our companies have 40% of their revenue coming from Europe and only 36% of their revenue actually coming from North America. So that order is slightly reversed. The other interesting thing to note is that although we do not invest directly in emerging market listed companies, some of our development market companies actually do have revenues coming from emerging markets, which includes Latin America and the Middle East. So on to our investment philosophy. Now, as you know, this is identical to Fundsmith. We buy good companies, we don't overpay, and then we try to do nothing. And by good companies, we do, of course, mean those companies that generate a high return on invested capital and generate a lot of cash in relation to the amount of earnings. And the best companies of all are then able to reinvest that cash into the business and compound the returns into the future. This is a slide that is also provided for the funds with equity fund, which is why we have included their column on the far right-hand side. We call this the portfolio look through. So this is an amalgamation of the operating metrics of the companies in our portfolio. So the, you have the Smithson Investment Trust portfolio companies on the left-hand column. You have our reference index, the MCI World SMID index in the middle, and then as mentioned, Fundsmith on the right. The top line there, return on capital employed, is the profits of the company divided by the amount of capital invested in that company. And it is our preferred measure of quality. You can see here that for the Smith and Investment Trust, the return on capital employed on average for the companies is 28%. Now this is even excluding Rightmove, our highest return company, because they have returns above 1,000%. So obviously that would have skewed the average had we included them. Now that 28% obviously compares very favorably to our reference index at 11%. And it is even broadly in line with the Fundsmith Equity Fund at 29%. And for that reason, we are extremely pleased that we've been able to find companies of a similar quality to the large cap Fundsmith Equity Fund within our small and mid cap space. Now moving down, we have gross margin. Now, gross margin simply is the difference between what it costs to make the physical product of a company and what that company is able to sell it for. So with a gross margin of 66%, that means that our companies make something for 34 and then sell it for 100. Now, compared to the reference index, those companies selling an item for 100 have to spend 67 to make it. So a lot worse than our gross margin. And again, pleasingly, our gross margin is very similar to the very high quality companies in the Fundsmith Equity Fund. Now the next line is operating profit margin. And this is what most people refer to as profit. So this is after all of the other additional costs, such as Salesforce costs, R&D, administration, and so on. And again, when you compare the Smithson Investment Trust at 32% against our reference index, you can see that our companies have far stronger profit margins than the average in the index. And the next line down is cash conversion, because of course it's very important to us how much of the profits arrive in cash. Because for many companies, they may show strong accounting profits, but actually when you dig deeper, they are not receiving much cash at all. 
Now, in our case, this is a number of how much cash arrives in comparison to the operating profit. Now, here it says 104%, suggesting that they get more cash than they do generate in profit. Now, that might sound confusing, but the reason is because they receive cash from their customers, on average, sooner than they have to pay their suppliers. This means that as the companies grow, they are building a small pool of cash, which is not actually theirs to keep, but it does mean that they are receiving more cash than the profits they generated in that year because they are growing. Now, obviously, that would flip around if they started shrinking, but the reason that we own these companies in the first place is for their growth much of the time. Now, the final line is to give an illustration of the strength of their balance sheets. We haven't put leverage there because actually the vast majority of our companies have net cash on the balance sheet rather than any debt. So we instead have put interest cover, which is a very simple metric to use. And you can see that 34 times interest cover, that is by how many times their profits cover their interest payments, you can see that relative to the index, they are in a far stronger position. Now, the second part of our philosophy is don't overpay. So I think we've demonstrated that we own good companies, certainly relative to the index and even in comparison with the funds with equity fund. Now, this is what we are having to pay for them. So soon after launch, back in December 2018, the average free cash flow yield, now that is the amount of cash generated in a year divided by the market capitalization, was 4.2% for Smithson Investment Trust and was actually the same 4.2% for our reference index. Now, as 29 progressed, you can see that the companies got a little more expensive. They were 3.7% in June and 3.4% in December of 2019. But the interesting fact is that actually they stayed in a relatively similar valuation to the reference index. And the reason for that is, although our companies outperformed the index in terms of share price appreciation, they also grew their free cash flow faster than those companies in the benchmark. And that is why they were able to, even while the share price was increasing faster, maintain that free cash flow yield in a relative sense to the index. Now, obviously, since the end of 2019, when we had this market sell-off, you can imagine that that free cash flow yield has returned above 4.2% uh, and is actually now cheaper than it was when we started. It's difficult to give an exact number because obviously uh, profits are moving and cash flow is moving around a lot this year as we speak. But the indication is that uh, those companies are looking a lot more attractive now than they did even when we launched back in 2018. <clears throat> and finally, do nothing. Now, why do we say do nothing? Well, first of all, it costs money to do something. We have to pay dealing um, charges every time we make a change in the portfolio. So the more we did that, the more it would drag on the performance of the fund. But second, we also believe we're human and fallible. And so the more that we did, the more mistakes we're likely to make. We feel if we set up a good portfolio in the first place, the less that we tinker with it, the better it will be in terms of performance and the less mistakes we will make. So what we say is our ideal holding period is forever and we'll only exit a position if management makes bad capital decisions or we reappraise the investment case or if it becomes too expensive. Now, what we actually did in 2019 is we sold CDK Global for the reason that we believe management was about to make bad capital allocation decisions. On the other hand, as mentioned, we bought Fever Tree Drinks back in July. And I'll talk you through why we decided to do it then. So when we started the fund in 2018, we admired Fever Tree very much. At the time, it was growing extremely quickly in the UK, which is still its largest market of around 50% of the group. But unfortunately, to our minds, it was at a valuation that did not seem at all reasonable. 
Now, over the next few months, what we saw was that the share price declined by nearly 50%, while at the same time, the free cash flow generated by the company almost doubled. Now, that made the valuation on free cash flow a lot more attractive than it was just six months ago. We think the reason that the share price declined so much is that the UK market started to slow from quite a rapid 40% growth in 2018 to a very more pedestrian mid-single-digit growth in 2019. And actually, by the end of 2019, that growth was close to zero. So we think that investors got um, upset with that development and is the reason the share price fell by so much. Now, to our mind, we believe that the UK has become a mature market for them, and we feel that this won't continue to grow at anything more than a low single-digit rate. However, they've got very exciting market positions in other large markets, including the US, Europe, and Asia. US, for example, was just a fledgling business for them in 2018 when we started the fund, but by the end of 2019, it has now become a lot more established with Fever Tree signing bottling contracts and distribution contracts with major distributors in the country. This, therefore, makes that position galvanized and we believe possible to grow rapidly, probably in the region of about 30%. And obviously, it being a much larger market has an extreme uh, level of potential for the future. They are also growing rapidly in Europe and in Asia, although in Asia, obviously, it's a much smaller business. So that's the reason we bought Fever Tree, and it has continued to fall, actually, during this period of the pandemic. I think because people are very concerned that during a period of lockdown, uh, there aren't going to be many people going to bars and restaurants, which is, of course, true. However, I, for some days, have been trying to get tonic in the supermarket, and I found it simply impossible. So bearing in mind that about 50% of Fever Tree sales is done through supermarkets, I think that at least that part of the business should prove to be okay. So just to finish up, for the turnover in 2019, we, it was around 6.1%. And in terms of the fees, our ongoing charges figure was 1%, and that includes the management fee of 0.9%. And because of the low turnover, our dealing costs were very low at 0.04%. During the period, we issued 30.6 million shares for proceeds of 362 million. And the important thing to note is that all of these shares were issued at a premium. And on average, that premium to NAV was 2.9%. The reason that's important is because whenever shares are issued at a premium to NAV, it benefits the existing shareholders. The reason for that is because the fund receives more cash than is given away in underlying value per share. So now I'll, let's move on to what's been happening to the portfolio in 2020. Here is a slide to show the performance per month so you can see how the fund has progressed during the market volatility as the market reacted to COVID-19. Now, in January, actually, the Smithson portfolio was up 0.2%, while the share price was slightly down 0.3%, and our reference index was down 1.4%. Now, things got really interesting by March, of course, when the market fell precipitously after many participants realized that COVID-19 was spreading across the world. During that month of March, up to and including the 26th of March, and the reason we picked the 26th of March is it's the latest date that we could get the data for and get it checked for the presentation. That was last Thursday. The Smithson NAV during that period was only down 4.1%, while our reference index was down 13.3%. So we feel actually the portfolio held up very well. And if you look at the year-to-date period as a whole up to that 26th of March, the portfolio was down 8.4%, while the reference index was down over 20%. Now, the final thing to note, of course, is that the share price for Smithson was a lot more volatile than the underlying NAV. 
And I think that it's an interesting fact that the share price has been a lot more volatile because obviously that hasn't been directly correlated to the NAV, but it has meant that the shares for the first time have started trading at a discount. Now, while I can't offer any predictions as to what's going to happen in this period, I do find it's helpful to separate the, under, the, the concept of the underlying value and the share price. And I'd actually liken the underlying value of the portfolio and the companies in the portfolio to a walker crossing a field. If you can cast your mind back to a time when we were actually allowed to leave the house, and you can picture a dog walker crossing a field with its dog zigzagging wildly around it, Imagine that the dog walker is the underlying value of the company or the portfolio, steady in its direction and making progress across the field. While the share price itself is like the dog, wildly running around. Now, in the current environment, obviously, that dog is carrying under shelter while the storm rages, but the walker trudges on. Now, they might pause or even trip, but because we own good companies, they will get back up again and keep walking. And we know that eventually the dog will run out to meet them. And this is another reason why we own good companies. Because in a storm such as this, bad companies, should they trip or fall, may never get up again. Now, I did also want to mention that while we had a few companies like Rightmove and Saver, which have been negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, we do actually also have some companies that have benefited. One of these is called Fisher & Paykel, and they actually provide respiratory equipment. Now, as you might imagine, they have seen demand surge over the last few weeks, and management tell us that they are able to meet that demand by ramping up their capacity, and so they are starting to benefit from that. Another company we own that's benefited is called Massimo, mentioned in a slide previously. Now, they make blood monitoring equipment, and these monitors are very useful for patients in intensive care. So as we see intensive care beds increase, we also see the demand for their monitors increase. And finally, we have a company called Ambu, which is a Danish medical device company that makes disposable endoscopes. Now, these are mostly for pulmonary conditions and have been used on COVID-19 patients. Now, it's important to note that these endoscopes are disposable because normally endoscopes are reused on patient after patient. In fact, up to 200 patients before they're changed. Now, obviously, they are cleaned in between the use, but in this period, it is noted that that cleaning is not perfect and subsequent patients can still become infected by using the same endoscope as a previous COVID-19 patient. So for that reason, AMBU's disposable endoscopes, which are used only once before they're thrown away, have become critical in treating these patients. And AMBU is the only company that are able to make these disposable endoscopes at scale. They have therefore also been benefiting from the current pandemic. So finally, with all this in mind, I wanted to just include a slide that we had in our original presentation when we launched the IPO back in 2018. <clears throat> that is why the period you can see there is a 15-year period that runs from 2002 to 2017. We toyed with updating the slide to the end of 2019, but then realized it would look like we were taking it to the peak of the market, and we didn't want to raise any questions as to our cherry-picking of time, so we decided to just leave it how it was. But what this shows is this you'd invested £10,000 in the S&P 500, a US index, in 15, over 15 years, you would see a 351% increase, or £45,101, if you'd have just left it alone, fully invested. However, if you tried to time the market by selling and buying back, and had missed just the 10 best days in the market over those 15 years, your return would more than halve to only 21000 300 pounds. And in fact, if you'd been so unfortunate as to miss the 30 best days, you would have lost money over those 15 years instead of making the 350% return. 
So the reason I show this during the current time is that while we can't possibly know what's to come next, we do know that trying to time the market is impossible. And for that reason, it is not timing the market that is going to make money, but it's time in the market which counts. And so with that, Hugo, I'd be happy to answer any questions that have been submitted. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question we have is as follows. Smithson has been trading at a substantial discount um, to the net asset value recently. At the same time, many of our company share prices have fallen substantially. Is it the view of the board and the manager um, to keep purchasing additional shares in existing or new holdings rather than deploying any cash in the portfolio to buy back Smithson shares to manage the discount? Okay, well, we were very fortunate going into this crisis to have had some cash in the portfolio. And we've actually been spending that cash on buying more shares in the companies we own as the share prices have declined. Now, at that period, at the beginning of the period during that time, the Smithson share price was not yet at a discount to NAV. Now that it is, though, buying back Smithson shares does appear attractive, but it's a board decision rather than a portfolio manager decision, and I know that the board is currently discussing it. What I suspect is the case is that the board will be looking for a sustained discount to NAV before they start taking action to buy shares and reduce, try to reduce that, that discount. It's also worth noting that we've got a facility to take on 15% of debt, and that debt can be used to buy back Smithson shares as well. So again, this is currently being discussed by the board, and I think if that discount is sustained above 10%, I think that is something that they are very likely to consider. Thank you. Uh, the second question, uh, you mentioned that the UK market for fever tree should be considered mature and that growth of around 3% is likely to continue. Are the growth rates which are achievable overseas more than capable of making up for the low growth rate in the UK market? The short answer is yes. Um, yes, it's, it's a very good point worth noting that the UK, as mentioned, is around 50% still of Fever Tree Group revenues. And if that's growing at 3%, that is obviously not a particularly high growth company. However, um, the US is now 20% of their business, and that is growing at 30%. So funnily enough, it probably won't grow 30% this year uh, for two reasons. One, they're decreasing their price of tonic in the US as a one-off. Um, because they felt pricing had got too high, too premium. So they're bringing those prices down in line with the UK and Europe so that prices are aligned uh, across all the regions. But of course, as mentioned during this period of lockdown, if you see a closing of the bars and restaurants in the US as you have in the UK, um, they will suffer um, to a degree in that case. Then you look at the rest of their business. They have 25% of their business in Europe, and that's growing mid-teens, around 16% last year. And then they've got a rest of the world segment, which includes Asia, um, as well as uh, Australia is quite a big market within that. Uh, that's 5% of the business, and that's growing at about 25%. So while you've got 50% of the business in the UK growing at 3%, the other 50% of the business is growing between mid-teens and 30%, so significantly offsetting that slower growth. Thank you. Um, third question, is there any evidence that the attributes of the portfolio companies make them more resilient in the current crisis than their share prices would suggest? Well, there's not any current hard evidence because none of our companies have actually reported a period which includes this current pandemic. But what I would say is that while these companies are very likely to lose revenue during this crisis, because they are very high quality, they have high operating margins and strong cash generation as we've gone through. So this means even as the revenues decline, they are still able to generate cash during the crisis. 
And on top of this, they've also got strong balance sheets. So the majority of them have got little or no debt whatsoever. So that means that shareholders can be confident that they will not go bust during this period. And because they are still generating cash, they can actually go through the period still investing in R&D, still employing key employees, and don't have to cut costs down to the bone like weaker companies may have to. Which means, of course, that once you come out of this crisis, the quality companies are even stronger in a relative sense to the poor companies than they were before. So we don't actually have any hard evidence in terms of numbers yet, but we are very certain that they will prove to become more resilient than even the market is giving the credit for today. Good. Um, next question. Has the investable universe changed uh, since the inception of Smithson? Yes, it has actually. So the investable universe is our investment list, if you like, that we, from which we choose the portfolio. So when we launched, we had found 83 companies to put in our investable universe, this investment list. And these were, the, at the time, the 83 companies that we would ever consider investing in. From that, obviously, we picked the portfolio, which was 29 companies at launch. And um, that investable universe, a little like the portfolio, has changed over the period since inception. The investable universe actually has changed a bit more because, as you might imagine, some of the companies in that investable universe are companies which we just want to watch very closely because we think they are almost good enough for the portfolio, but not quite. So we will continue monitoring them to see if they make it over the line, but they're not poor enough to just ignore. Now, during the period since inception, we have actually taken eight companies out of the investable universe. Now, those eight companies were broadly those companies that we were monitoring, but then over time felt that actually they hadn't made the grade. And we decided for whatever reason, either their growth didn't pick up or the returns didn't prove to be as resilient as we thought, we decided to kick them out of that investable universe. At the same time, though, we did actually add four new companies. Now, these are companies that um, we continued to search the market and discovered uh, during subsequent searches after our launch. And after doing further research on them, realized that they more than deserved to be on in our investable universe and watched closely in terms of um, a potential inclusion in the portfolio itself in the future. Thank you. Um, how much has Terry Smith been involved with Smithson over the past year? Well, <clears throat> Terry is very much an advisory role to Smithson and an invaluable resource to us. So day to day, myself and the assistant portfolio manager, Will Morgan, run the portfolio. We make all the decisions um, in terms of uh, investing the proceeds of share issuance, or in the case of the recent period, choosing which companies to invest in uh, on the back of share price declines. And actually, we have taken advantage of the most recent um, market falls to actually add a new company to the portfolio. Um, unfortunately, we can't give out the name of that port company yet because we haven't finished buying the position. We wanted to buy it slowly in the case of uh, further market turmoil. But once we've completely uh, finished that position, we will, of course, inform you all of what that company is. So day to day, Will and I are doing that amongst ourselves. But in any period where we want to take a major action, such as selling a company outright, like we did CDK Global, or buying a new company like Fever Tree or the company we've just bought, um, we will always uh, speak to Terry to receive his advice and benefit from his 40 odd years of experience. And that has really been invaluable to us. So day to day, we set about things on our own because Terry is 100% focused on the Fundsmith Equity Fund. But from time to time, we will get in touch and ask his advice on major decisions. Perfect. And uh, the final question here is, what is the capacity of the fund? Well, that, the answer to that question will obviously change over time. 
it is very dependent on the liquidity of the underlying companies that we're invested in. And of course, as everyone knows, the reason this is formed as an investment trust is so that it is a permanent capital vehicle and we are free to invest in smaller companies which are less liquid than large cap companies. Now, we will therefore have to monitor the progression of our ability to buy and sell those smaller companies as the fund grows and that will indicate the final capacity. As it stands now, we have absolutely no concerns or constraints regarding the liquidity of our companies. Everything that we've tried to buy, we've been able to do quite quickly. And even when we sold an entire position in CDK Global, um, we were able to do so in a matter of days. And actually that was taking our time. We could have done it in, uh, in only three or four days had we wanted to. So at the moment, there is absolutely no capacity constraints um, in terms of the liquidity we're discovering in our companies. But if we were to think about this logically, on average, the market cap size of the companies we own is approaching £8 billion. Now, if we were to only own around 2% of each one of those companies, and we own roughly 30 companies now, that would be in the region of £4.8 billion. So we think that a uh, fund size up to about £5 billion should be no problem to us because a 2% holding in each of those companies is not at all large. So for now, that's the size that we suspect will be okay. But obviously, as time goes on and the fund gets larger and we have experience in actually trading the fund at that larger size, we will be able to give a more concrete answer. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, I think we'll bring things to a close there. If anyone has any further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Our contact details can be found on the Smithson website. Um, many thanks.